Hello once again everyone and welcome to Lab 4, Mitosis and the Cell Cycle. At this point in lab we've talked quite a bit about cells and whether you took biology in high school or you're taking it in college one of the things that you should be familiar with from a general biology class is the cell theory. The cell theory says that all living organisms are composed of one or more cells and the smallest living organisms are single cells. In addition, the cell theory also says that all cells come from pre-existing cells. Now, throughout our daily activities, the cells that make up our bodies are constantly being worn away and replaced by new cells. So in today's lab, we'll focus on the features of the eukaryotic cell cycle, the process whereby cells grow, replicate their genetic material, and divide to produce those new replacement cells. When a cell reproduces itself, it gives rise to two daughter cells, and those two daughter cells are not only identical to each other, but they're also identical to the original parent cell. Okay, before this process can happen, though, before a cell can reproduce itself, there are three important things that have to happen. The cell has to grow, the cell has to replicate its cytoplasmic constituents, and the cell must also replicate its DNA. If a cell didn't grow before it divided, what would happen with each subsequent division is that the cells would get smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually there was nothing left. So before a cell can divide, it has to grow and get bigger. Cells must also replicate cytoplasmic constituents. Okay, what this means is that all of those organelles that are in the cell must also be copied before a cell divides. So for example, let's assume that uh, we're talking about the division of one of your liver cells. Remember your liver is um, a filter. It filters out toxins and metabolic waste products and the cells that make up the liver are rich in smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so before those cells must divide we have to make copies of that smooth endoplasmic reticulum so that each of the daughter cells that's produced as a result of cell division contains those organelles and become functional cells. Lastly, before a cell divides, the cell must also make a copy of its DNA. Remember that all cells must have a functional copy of DNA. The figure at the bottom of the screen here shows you the basic overall process of cell division. Okay, so starting off with a single parent cell, that cell grows and replicates everything in the cytoplasm. It then makes copies of its DNA before splitting and forming two identical daughter cells. Now the actual process of cell division is much more complicated than this simple figure demonstrates. So as we continue, we'll talk in more detail about the factors that control the cell cycle. Before we move into the details of the cell cycle though, I want to go back and talk a little bit more in detail about DNA and chromosomes. Right, last week we talked in detail about DNA and you should remember that DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid is the genetic information of all organisms okay, and that DNA is housed in the cell's nucleus. Now remember last week we also said that because our cells are eukaryotic the genes that are associated with those eukaryotic cells also have a very unique arrangement. Okay, the same is true of eukaryotic chromosomes. In eukaryotic cells, DNA is associated with special proteins called histones, and it's those histone proteins okay, that allow DNA to condense to form a chromosome. The figure here shows you the relationship between histone proteins and DNA. Okay, those histone proteins are small spherical proteins represented by the small green circles here in the figure, and basically what they do is they take the DNA and they wind it around it. So again, DNA winds around histone proteins, and as those histones wind the DNA around them, that DNA condenses to form the chromosome. Okay, to help you visualize what happens here with um, this process, think of what happens if you take a uh, tennis ball and wrap a shoestring around it. Okay, as you wrap the shoestring around the tennis ball, that sh string becomes shorter and shorter. Okay, so the same is basically um, true here with histones and DNA. Okay. In this analogy, the um, histone protein is represented by 
the um, tennis ball and the DNA strand represented by the shoe string. Okay, so again, the same basic process is happening here. Okay, that DNA strand is winding around that histone protein to form a chromosome. And when you think of a chromosome, this is the typical image that comes to mind. Okay. Okay. Each chromosome consists of one double helix that's been condensed down. Okay. And all chromosomes have the same basic structure. Okay. Notice there's a central region called the centromere, and extending from the centromere on either side are two branches which are called the arms of the chromosome. Now remember we said that before a cell can divide it has to replicate its DNA. Okay, and when the DNA is replicated, okay, we end up with a replicated chromosome that looks like this. Notice how the replicated chromosome looks like two individual chromosomes that have been attached together at the centromere. Okay, replicated chromosomes attached in this way are referred to as sister chromatids. Okay, now, having an understanding of the structure of the replicated chromosome is particularly important when we begin talking about what actually happens when a cell divides. Okay, eventually, what happens is that those two sister chromatids will be separated so that each of the two daughter cells that's produced as a result of division will contain one of those sister chromatids. Again, remember, we want to make sure that the, the cells that are produced as a result of replication have a copy of the genetic material. So before we move on, make sure you're comfortable with the structure of the replicated chromosome. This next figure here shows you the relationship between the DNA double helix, histone proteins, and the chromosome. Again, remember that uh, each chromosome consists of a single DNA double helix. Now in this figure that the DNA has been replicated so we see a pair of sister chromatids attached at the centromere. All right, let's move on now and talk in more detail about the eukaryotic cell cycle. Okay, the eukaryotic cell cycle is divided into two main parts, okay, the first of which is called interphase. Okay, interphase is extremely important because it's during interphase that a cell grows and replicates its chromosomes. Okay, because interphase is so important, okay, most of a cell's lifetime is spent in interphase. Okay, the actual process of cell division okay, is called mitosis. And when we think of the cell cycle and cell division, it's the process of mitosis that we generally think of. Okay. But mitosis only constitutes a very small portion of the cell's life cycle. Okay. To better demonstrate this, let's take a look at our first figure. Okay, notice here in this figure okay, that interphase basically occupies the majority of that cell cycle. Mitosis, which is represented with the uh, yellow block there, uh, again is only a small portion of the cell's life cycle. Okay, because interphase is so important, we'll begin by discussing um, interphase and each of the three divisions that we see here in the figure. Okay, so again notice that interphase consists of three separate stages, G1, S, and G2. G stands for growth. Okay, so in the cell cycle and in interphase, we have growth phase one, the S phase, which is when DNA chromosomes are replicated or synthesized, and then we have growth phase two. Okay, now the growth phases are very important because it's during those phases when um, a cell is growing and replicating its cytoplasmic constituents. Okay. Growth phase one okay, is the most variable of those phases in terms of length. 
So what this means is that some cells will move through growth phase one fairly quickly, whereas other cells might uh, take their time in moving through okay, the G1 phase. Okay, for example, epithelial cells, the cells of your skin, okay, those, those cells are constantly being sloughed off and worn away. So we constantly have to replace those cells. So it makes sense that an epithelial cell okay, would move through the growth phase one fairly quickly. Okay, other cells like the cells of your liver, for example, okay, take a much um, slower okay, route in moving through the growth phase there. So growth phase one is the most variable of the phases in terms of length. So again, some cells will move through it fairly quickly, whereas other cells will move through it a little more slowly. After a cell moves through growth phase one, it enters the S phase where DNA is synthesized. After DNA is synthesized, the cell then moves into growth phase two. Okay. Again, in growth phase two, the cell is growing. It's replicating cytoplasmic constituents and also in growth phase two, the cell is producing some important um, proteins and enzymes that are necessary for the cell to move from interphase and into that mitotic phase. Okay, so interphase is very important because it's during interphase when those three things that we said must happen before a cell divides occurs. So again, the cell is, is growing, it's replicating its cytoplasmic constituents, and it's also copying the DNA during interphase. Before we move on, I want to back up and talk in more detail about the S phase, DNA synthesis. And in doing so, we'll look at the process of DNA replication. Okay. Again, remember that before a cell can divide, it has to make a copy of its genetic material. Okay. And this process is called DNA replication. And DNA replication occurs during the S phase of interphase, and as a result, we end up with two copies of the cell's DNA. Remember that DNA is a double-stranded molecule having a helical shape or a twisted ladder shape. And in the process of DNA replication, the two sides of that DNA molecule are separated or pulled apart, and each side is used as a template to make a new complementary strand. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the process of DNA replication. Okay, this figure here shows us the basic overall process of DNA replication. Okay, and looking at it, it appears that conceptually the process of DNA replication is fairly simple. Okay, basically what we have is an original DNA double helix okay, and what happens is we pull the two sides of that DNA double helix apart and then we make a complementary copy of each of the sides. And at the end of this process we have two new DNA strands or two new DNA molecules. Let's take a look at our next figure. Okay, so again in the process of DNA replication, okay, we start off with a single DNA double helix. Okay. At the end of DNA replication, okay, we end up with two identical DNA double helices. Notice that in the figure here, the two new double helices that are produced each contains one blue strand and one red strand. Each of the red strands that are produced as a result of DNA replication are newly made strands. And the blue strands are the old strands. So what happens in the process of DNA replication is that each of the sides of the DNA backbone is used as a template to produce a new complementary strand. And as a result, the two double helices that are produced each contain one of the newly made strands and one of the old strands. And because each 
DNA double helix contains a new strand and an old strand. This process is referred to as semi-conservative replication. In other words, we're conserving or retaining one of the original strands and we're adding a newly made strand to it. Okay, so once again, this process conceptually seems fairly simple. Okay, we take a, an original double helix, we pull it apart, and then we make copies of each of the two sides. But the process of DNA replication is much more complicated than what we've just described here. Okay, basically what I've done here is given you the Cliff Notes version of DNA replication. Okay, obviously though, this uh, DNA double helix doesn't magically just pull itself apart and magically make a copy of both of the strands. Okay, to do this, the DNA needs help, and it gets that help in the form of a special set of enzymes. DNA replication begins when an enzyme called DNA helicase binds to the double helix and breaks the hydrogen bonds between the complementary base pairs. When those hydrogen bonds are broken, a replication bubble forms, okay, which we can see here in the figure at the bottom of the screen. Okay, once that replication bubble is formed, that leaves room for another enzyme to then move in and attach to both of the exposed DNA strands. So let's take a look at our next figure. Okay, notice at the top of the figure here we have basically a blown up version of what we saw on the last slide. Okay, so you can see the replication bubble there and the DNA uh, helicase molecules attached to the DNA strands. Okay, again, remember once those replication bubbles form, okay, another molecule, another enzyme, will then move in and bind to both of the complementary DNA strands. Okay, the enzyme that binds to each DNA strand is called DNA polymerase. Okay, notice that there are two of those molecules uh, labeled in the figure at the bottom of the screen. Okay, the one on the uppermost strand is labeled DNA polymerase number one, and on the bottom strand there we see DNA polymerase number two. Now DNA polymerase is very important. Basically, it's the polymerase molecule that does most of the work here. Okay, polymerase is responsible for reading the base sequence on the original DNA strand and matching it with a complementary base. So basically it's the DNA polymerase that's responsible for making the new complementary strand. Okay, as we continue to talk about the DNA uh, replication process here, I want you to focus on um, the bottom figure and the uppermost strand, the strand to which DNA polymerase number one is attached. Okay, notice at the edge of that replication bubble Okay, there is a DNA helicase enzyme. Okay. Now DNA helicase, as it continues, okay, will proceed okay, in this direction. Okay, so in other words, it's moving in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction. Okay, and as it moves, it continues to break hydrogen bonds and expose bases, forming more replication bubbles, or extending that replication bubble. Now, as that helicase enzyme moves and continues to break hydrogen bonds, DNA polymerase number one follows right along behind it. And as it does so, it continues to synthesize that new complementary strand. Okay, so again, we can see the direction that DNA polymerase moves here, represented by the pink arrow. Okay, so again, DNA polymerase following right along behind the helicase. Okay, so what this means is that as new DNA is exposed, that DNA polymerase molecule can just move right along behind the helicase and continue to make a complete complementary copy of the DNA strand. Okay, but what about the DNA polymerase molecule attached to the bottom strand? Which direction does it move? Does it also follow the DNA helicase? No, it doesn't. Okay, DNA polymerase number two moves in the opposite direction. Okay, so we see it moving in this direction, represented by the orange arrow there. So the question is, why doesn't DNA polymerase move in the same direction? Why can't it move just like DNA polymerase, does, polymerase one does and follow right along behind the 
DNA helicase and just make a continuous copy of the DNA as it's exposed. Okay, you should remember from last week we talked about the structure of DNA and we said that the two DNA strands are anti-parallel. One strand runs 3' prime to 5', prime, the other strand runs 5' prime to 3'. Prime. Okay, and many of you probably thought, why do we care? Why does it matter which strand is which? Okay. Remember I told you we care which strand is which when it comes time to talk about DNA replication. Okay, the reason we care which strand is oriented 3' prime to 5' prime and which is oriented 5' prime to 3' prime is because of that DNA polymerase molecule. Okay, DNA polymerase can only move in one direction. It can only move from 3' prime to 5'. Prime. Notice that DNA polymerase 1 is moving in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction, and as it does so, it synthesizes newly made DNA in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So again, DNA polymerase is moving from the 3' prime end of that original DNA strand to the 5' prime end. The same is true of DNA polymerase number 2. It's moving from the 3' prime end of the original DNA strand to the 5' prime end. But remember I just told you that DNA polymerase can only move in one direction. Okay, so what does that mean for the bottom DNA strand? It can't back up and copy DNA at the 3' prime end as it's exposed by the DNA helicase. So how are we supposed to copy okay, the rest of that DNA that hasn't yet been exposed if that DNA polymerase number 2 can only move in one direction? Okay, what eventually happens is that as more of that DNA is exposed, another DNA polymerase enzyme will then move in and copy from the 3' prime end to the 5' prime end on that bottom strand. So essentially what happens is that that bottom strand, that newly made complementary strand, is produced in pieces, in segments. Whereas the complementary strand that's produced using the DNA strand at the top, the 3' prime to 5' prime direction along which DNA polymerase 1 travels, is made as one continuous piece. Okay, so the upper strand is made as a continuous piece, whereas the bottom strand is made in segments. So let's take a look at our next figure. Again, remember DNA polymerase number one, which is attached to the uppermost strand, moves in the three prime to five prime direction, following right along behind the DNA helicase. And as it does so, it makes a complementary DNA strand as one continuous piece. DNA polymerase on the bottom most strand, however, cannot back up and copy newly exposed DNA. Okay, so what happens is a series of DNA polymerase enzymes are used to synthesize a complementary strand in segments. So at the end of this process, we end up with one DNA double helix that has breaks in the backbone of the newly made strand. But obviously this isn't going to work. Okay, remember in a functional DNA molecule, okay, that sugar phosphate backbone is one continuous piece. In order to fix the problem, okay, in order to stitch those pieces together, we need another enzyme. And that enzyme, highlighted here with the green arrow, is called DNA ligase. Okay, ligase is important because it comes into that uh, newly made strand and stitches the pieces of it together Okay, so that everything is linked together to form one continuous DNA strand. So it's important for you to understand what's happening overall in the process of DNA replication. Okay, DNA helicase again binds to DNA, breaks the hydrogen bonds between the complementary base pairs and forms a replication bubble, at which point DNA polymerase then moves in, attaches to both of the original DNA strands, and moves in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction making a new complementary strand. One of those new complementary strands will be synthesized as one continuous piece, whereas the other will be made in segments. Okay, those segments will later have to be stitched together by the enzyme DNA ligase.
Okay, now I know this concept is sort of abstract, so it's hard to visualize. Okay, so after the podcast, be sure to watch the YouTube video on DNA replication. As you watch the video, you'll find that the process of DNA replication is actually a little more complex than what I've gone through with you here. Okay, but try not to get um, bogged down um, by um, new terms and new terminology, that sort of thing that you're not familiar with. Okay, as long as you're comfortable with the information that I've given you here uh, in the podcast today, you should be fine. All right, let's move back once again and talk in more detail about the remainder of the cell cycle. Okay, at this point we've discussed the main features of interphase, okay, the uh, part of the cell cycle during which um, a cell grows, synthesizes its DNA, and prepares to move into the mitotic phase where the cell will actually divide and produce two new cells. But the question is, how does a cell know that it's time to move from one phase to the next? Okay, so for example, how does a cell know when it's ready to move from growth phase one into the yes phase? And how does a cell know when DNA synthesis is finished and can move into growth phase two? Although the factors that prod a cell to continue its progress through the cell cycle are poorly understood, we do know that there are several important factors to consider. Okay, and the first of which is cell volume to surface area ratio. Okay, the figure at the bottom of the screen here is one that you should be familiar with. Uh, we looked at it um, in an earlier lab this semester. And we talked about the concept of cell volume to surface area ratio. Remember we said that our bodies are composed of trillions of tiny cells because those smaller cells are better able to obtain the nutrients they need than our larger cells. Okay, remember, as a cell grows, its nutrient requirement increases, okay, and its ability to exchange uh, wastes with uh, the environment and obtain those nutrients decreases. So as a cell grows and its nutrient requirement increases and its ability to obtain those nutrients decreases, it makes sense that at a certain point that cell is going to uh, split and form two smaller cells which would then be better able to obtain nutrients they need in order to grow and survive. Okay, so again, cell volume to surface area ratio uh, is something very uh, important to consider okay, when talking about control of the cell cycle. Okay, the next major factor to consider are chemical signals. Okay, chemical signals can be a number of things including growth factors, hormones, cyclins and CDKs, and something called MPF. Now, cyclins and CDKs are something that you will go into a little more detail uh, with your online lecture course. Okay, so we'll um, really not go into any detail as far as cyclins and CDKs are concerned here in lab. One thing I do want to mention, though, at this point is MPF, okay, that last bullet point there on your screen. Okay, MPF stands for M Phase Promoting Factor. Now earlier I mentioned um, that during the uh, growth phase two, not only is a cell growing and replicating cytoplasmic constituents, but it's also producing proteins and enzymes that are necessary for the cell to move into the mitotic phase. Now specifically, okay, that protein and enzyme I was talking about is MPF, which again stands for M phase promoting factor. Okay, if that MPF is produced in sufficient quantity, Okay, then the cell will receive a signal that says, all right, we've grown all that we needed to do, we've replicated everything correctly, we're ready to move on and divide and form two new cells. Okay. If, however, that MPF is not produced or not produced in sufficient quantity, the cell will stop at the end of the G2 phase before entering mitosis. So chemical signals like MPF are very, very important as far as controlling the cell cycle. Throughout the cell cycle, there are several places where a cell will stop and ask the question if it's done everything it needs to do before moving on to the next cycle. So this figure here shows us where those three important checkpoints are located. There's a checkpoint near the end of growth phase one, 
a checkpoint at the end of the G2 phase, and there's also a checkpoint during mitosis. Okay, the G2 checkpoint we mentioned briefly in discussing MPF. Okay, remember the cell will halt at the G2 checkpoint, and if MPF is produced in sufficient quantity, the cell will then move on into mitosis. Of the three checkpoints that you see labeled here in the figure, okay, the G1 checkpoint is probably the most important. Okay, the G1 checkpoint is commonly referred to as the restriction point. If a cell reaches the restriction point and doesn't receive a signal that says it's okay to move on into the remainder of the cell cycle, the cell will stop and enter a dormant phase called the GO phase. Okay, when a cell enters the GO phase, okay, it basically does nothing. It's not growing, it's not replicating anything, it's basically just sitting there. Now some cells will enter the GO phase and at some point later on in the life cycle of the cell will receive a signal that says, all right, it's okay to move out of the GO phase and continue on through the cycle. There are some cells though that enter the GO phase and never leave. Okay, so in other words, those cells are terminally differentiated. They can't grow, they can't replicate their DNA, and they certainly cannot divide. An example of a cell that enters the GO phase and never leaves are the cells of your nervous tissue. So for example, think about what happens to someone who suffers a spinal cord injury. Unfortunately, with spinal cord injuries, it generally leads to an individual being paralyzed. and the damage to that nervous tissue is permanent. Okay, it's permanent because that tissue cannot replicate itself. It can't regenerate. Those cells are stuck in the GO phase. And this is one of the many reasons why scientists are so interested in stem cells. Okay, stem cells are basically your body's master cell. So they can theoretically develop into any of the cells in your bodies. So it's thought that with stem cell therapy, individuals who have um, nerve damage okay, can be treated successfully okay, by the use of stem cells that could replace the damaged tissue. Okay, one additional point that I also want to make about the GO phase um, is that uh, many researchers believe that um, cells entering the GO phase may be a safeguard against cancer. Remember that all the cells in our bodies have a finite lifespan, so they're not going to live forever. Okay? And as they get older, they may wear out and not function properly. Okay? So in an older cell that's not working correctly, okay, we don't want to um, continue to replicate a cell that's, that's non-functional. Okay? If, if this happens, uh, we can have um, mutations develop and cancerous cells develop as a result. So again, cells entering the GO phase may be a way our bodies naturally fight the growth of cancer. All right, this next figure here basically shows you what happens when a um, growth factor um, controls uh, the cell cycle or signals the cell cycle to move from one phase of the cycle to the next. Uh, the figure here is a fairly simple and fairly straightforward. So basically what we see here happening is a some sort of growth factor, whether it be a, a hormone or some other sort of chemical factor, binds to a receptor protein on the surface of a cell. That receptor protein then sends a signal uh, to um, the cell's control center uh, that tells the cell it's okay to move past a checkpoint and into the next phase of the cycle. In addition to cell volume and surface area ratio and chemical signals, okay, one final factor that controls the cell cycle is the availability of space. Okay, normally when our cells start growing and dividing, okay, they'll grow and replicate until they start touching one another. Okay, when those cells start touching one another, 
Okay, they exhibit something called contact inhibition. Okay, and that touch signals those cells that they need to stop dividing. Cancer cells do not exhibit contact inhibition. Okay, so cancer cells are going to grow and divide whether they've got space to grow and divide or not. They don't care. So cancerous cells will grow uncontrollably okay, and may eventually produce a tumor because they do not exhibit this contact inhibition. Okay, again, they don't care whether they have enough space available or not. Okay, but again, in our normal functioning cells, okay, those cells will stop dividing okay, when they start touching one another. Okay, at this point we've seen what happens in the process of interphase, okay, the, during which a cell grows, synthesizes new DNA, okay, and replicates all of its cytoplasmic constituents. Okay, so at this point, let's move on to the next phase of the cell cycle and talk about what happens when the cell actually starts to split into two new cells. Remember the process in which a cell divides is called mitosis, and mitosis consists of four phases prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. The figure at the bottom of the screen here represents one of the four phases of mitosis. After you complete the podcast, be sure you can come back to this figure and identify which of the four phases this figure represents. Okay, as we continue, we'll talk about each of the four phases of mitosis in more detail. Before we go into those details, however, let's return once again to interphase. Okay, remember interphase occupies the majority of a cell's life cycle. Okay, it's during interphase when a cell grows, replicates everything in the cytoplasm, and makes copies of the DNA. When you look at cells that are in interphase in a microscope, okay, there's one main feature that sticks out, and that's the presence of the nucleus. When looking at a cell in interphase, you can clearly see the nuclear envelope, okay, which separates the contents of the nucleus from the remainder of the cytoplasm. Okay. Moving into the actual process of mitosis, we begin to see quite a few distinct changes. Okay. The first phase of mitosis is called prophase. And in prophase, we can actually divide this into two separate stages. We have early prophase, which you see depicted on the left-hand side of the figure, and late prophase on the right-hand side of the figure. Okay, in prophase, there are several important things happening, okay, the first of which is the disintegration of the nuclear envelope. Okay, so the nuclear envelope starts to break down, okay, those chromosomes start to condense with the help of those histone proteins, and the spindle apparatus begins to form. Okay, progressing from early prophase to late prophase, we can see that the nuclear envelope has completely disintegrated, okay, the chromosomes have completely condensed, and we can now see that uh, the spindle fibers are beginning to attach to uh, those replicated chromosomes at a region called the kinetochore. From prophase, a cell then moves into metaphase. In metaphase, the replicated chromosomes line up along the equator of the cell, also referred to as the metaphase plate. In looking at cells in the phase of mitosis under a microscope, it's really easy to distinguish them from other phases of mitosis because you can clearly see the alignment of the chromosomes along the metaphase plate. Okay, so identifying metaphase of mitosis is uh, much easier uh, in comparison to some of the other stages of mitosis. Okay, from metaphase, a cell then moves into anaphase. In anaphase, those spindle fibers begin to contract or shorten, and as they do so, they pull the sister chromatids apart, separating them and moving them towards opposite ends of the cell. Okay, remember, it's important that we separate those sister chromatids because we want to ensure that each of the daughter cells that's produced as a result of this process each contains a complete copy of the DNA. From anaphase, a cell then enters telophase. Okay. In telophase, we begin to see the nuclear envelopes reforming 
um, around both sets of DNA that's been pulled towards opposite ends of the cell. And also we begin to see the uh, cells pinch in the center okay, to begin forming two separate cells. Okay, this process in which the cell pinches in the middle and separates the cytoplasm is called cytokinesis. At the end of this process, there will be two complete cells, both of which will be identical to each other and to the original cell. All right, this concludes this week's podcast. Be sure to complete the assignment associated with this week's lab, and also make sure you watch the supplemental videos um, that I'll post um, in association with this week's lab. Also keep in mind that the material that we covered today will be on your first test. Okay, so if you have any questions about any of the material, okay, don't hesitate to contact me.